Okay, welcome back. Um, these are the only two topics we still need to go through. Um, and then we're done with new content. I do want to spend time this week and next week, and actually not next week, next week's a break, two weeks' time, um, going through that uh, extra tutorial I had. Um, just make sure I still have copies of that around. I think it's that one. Yeah, that looks like it's the one. One of them, anyway. Yeah. That's that one. That's a different one. That's the other one. Okay, um, so let's, we don't have that much time left. Um, as I said, next week we have the Good Friday break, so I will not be here, so please don't be here. Um, I mean, if you want to come here and eat chocolate or something, I don't know. That's, I suppose that's the day after, anyway. Um, so then, uh, we've got uh, three weeks and then it's finals week. Now I'm going to run my final exactly the same way I ran my midterm. So you should now be able to book um, your final slot. I haven't released the final paper yet. It's going to look quite similar to the tutorial I handed out last week, at least some of the, the problems at the end. But um, please, uh, I'm aiming to release that next week, so uh, I'll, I'll put it up on Blackboard in the, um, let's see where I'll put it. I don't want 498. Right, assessment. And I'll add it to this final oral exam component once it's available. I'll also send out a, an announcement so you'll get it in email, but uh, I'll make sure it's up there too. So Today I want to talk about transients and three-phase circuits. They're the two topics that uh, we haven't covered yet. And I forgot to update that page. Let me grab my pen and draw on it anyway. <coughs> so three-phase circuits and transients. We've effectively done, or well, we are doing AC circuit analysis and RFC RL circuits. And then I'm going to try today and do a demonstration of the oscilloscope. And in two weeks time, we'll use the oscilloscope in the uh, I think it's Phasor's lab. So we'll, we should get that done. Okay, so let's have a look here. Transient. This course only looks at RL transients and RC transients. So transients in circuits with resistors and inductors, 
or transients in circuits with resistors and capacitors. The reason for that, as we'll see shortly, is if you've just got a resistor and inductor or just got a resistor and a capacitor, the equations describing how those circuits work are just first order differential equations. If you add th those three components together, resistors, inductors and capacitors, it's possible that the equations describing the circuit end up being a second order differential equation. And second order differential equations are basically beyond the scope of this course. Right, so if we have a capacitor and we know that for a capacitor the equation describing the current is I equals C D V D T. I equals the capacitance times the rate of change of the voltage or the gradient of the voltage or the derivative of the voltage. What that means is this. The voltage across a capacitor cannot change instantaneously. So if at time just before time t, the capacitor has 10 volts on it, at an infinitesimal time later, it's still got 10 volts on it. It can't go from 10 to 0 in a very short amount of time. Well, it could, but the current would be close to infinite, right? And that's not likely to happen. However, the current can change. The voltage can change. So if we start off with this circuit and assuming that the capacitor is has a non-zero initial voltage, right? Vc at time zero minus. I'm using zero minus. Is just before. Oops. Just before time zero. And then zero plus is just after. So if we look at this circuit and we decide to analyze it, right, we've got the voltage there at the top of the resistor and the capacitor is DC. So we've got IC and we've got IR. If we write Kirchhoff's current law for the node at the top, and even though I've drawn it as a dot, remember the node is an area of constant voltage. Right, so it's all around there. So if I do that, then I can write, I can write Kirchhoff's current law for it, right? So that's KCL. Because IC and IR are both flowing out of the node, I've used, I negate them, so minus IC minus IR equals zero. 
I can multiply that by minus 1, and so I get IC plus IR equals 0. And then I know two things about how to find the voltage, sorry, find the current. I know, as I said earlier, that the current through the capacitor is C dV dt. And I know for the resistor, it's just V on R, Ohm's law. And so I can take both of those and substitute them into this equation. And get that equation. C D V D T plus V on R equals zero. And then I can rearrange it a little bit by multiplying both sides by R. And then I can just bring VC to the other side. But in, in any case, even at that, that second last one, I hope you can see that that is a, a first order differential equation, right? It's got a derivative in it. It's only a it's only a, a derivative, it's not a second derivative. And it's got the actual quantity itself, Vc. So it's a, um, a first order differential equation. And I hope you've done enough math at this stage to know that the solution, the homogeneous solution to that uh, equation is just a decaying exponential. Right? So if we solve that, we get something like that. The voltage across the capacitor as a function of time is equal to the initial voltage times e to the minus t on RC. And RC is sometimes written as tau and it's called the time constant. So sometimes you'll see it as uh, Vc at times 0 minus e to the minus t on tau. Okay, so this is what happens when a capacitor is initially has a charge on it, a 10 volt and then you connect up a resistor to it and it discharges. We could do something very similar for when the capacitor starts up with zero volts on it and we apply a voltage through a, resi through a resistor to it. So here's a voltage Vs that we're applying to our capacitor. Right, and right, there's our current through the resistor. There's our current through the capacitor. So again, I can just write 
Photoshop's current law with IR flowing into the node and IC flowing out of the node. So IR minus IC equals zero. Again, I can say what the, the current through the capacitor is. I equals CDV dt. The current through the resistor is a little different from previous the previous example because now um, I have a, a VS on one side and a VC of T on the other. So the uh, Right, there's my current through the resistor. It's Vs minus Vc of T. And because it's and it's that way because we want the current to flow from left to right into the node we're interested in. We're interested in this node here. Again the dot is indicating the node, but really the node is the area of constant noise. And then just as before, I can take uh, IC and plug it in there. I can take IR and plug it in there. And that gets me that equation there. Right. IR minus IC, or Vs on Vc on R, minus C times dVc dt, equals zero. And then I can multiply everything by R, just so that I get the RC constant again. And I can play with it a bit, one way or the other. So this time the uh, the equation's a little bit more complicated, but it's solving still a first order differential equation. Right? The VC dt equals VC of t minus Vs on minus Rc. And again, because it's a first order differential equation, the solution to a first order differential equation is just a decaying exponential. So we get a decaying exponential. We've got a slight difference now though, because we've got a, a constant offset too. Remember back a few slides, back one slide, the voltage across a capacitor cannot change instantaneously. I equals C dV dt. So if the voltage changes instantaneously, you get an infinite current. So you can't change that, that voltage instantaneously. Okay. So let's have a look at this equation. As soon as we instantiate the equation we've got um, the remember this is charging the capacitor the capacitor has no charge on it so the voltage across the capacitor is zero the voltage across the capacitor is zero. Effectively, the, the green node is uh, at time. Uh, the green node is, is at earth, is at ground. Right? Ground is here. Right, so let's see what this 
the equation does at time zero. Remember I said the voltage across the capacitor VC at zero is zero. It's not charged yet. E to the zero is always one. Anything to the zero is always one. So The equation correctly gives us that the voltage across the capacitor at time zero is zero. I hope you've heard, done some differential equations, and usually the, the two times we're interested in with differential equations is the initial time, time zero, and then the infinite time, the final time, right? So let's have a look at that one. Right, Vc at infinity is Vs and I'm going to fill it in. I'm going to say Vc of 0 is 0. Right? E to the minus infinity. Well, that's 1 on E raised to the infinite power. 1 on E is one on 2.72 something, right? And if you square that, it's smaller. If you cube it, it's smaller still. So that's effectively zero. So what happens effectively is we start off at we start off at zero and we asymptotically approach Vs. Right, that number there is Vs. This is time. That number This one starts off at whatever it was. Let's say it starts off at Vs and it decays exponentially. Right? The shape of the curve is the same. It's just one of them's got a, an offset, Vs in this case, the other one has zero offset. But the trick in both of them is to know the initial value and the final value. Any questions about any of that? Should be mostly okay for you. I'm not going to go through this in quite as much detail, but it's exactly the same derivation, except 
now we're talking about inductors right and again we've got our IL and our IR and with that node here's our KCL equation oops that's not a KCL equation what is it? Jason, you know what it is. KVL, exactly. So let's try that again. Right? We've got it. We've already I should have I should have taken the the hint, right? There's a, a mesh current. Right? And now we've got Oops. Come on. Here we go. We can do our Don't know what I'm doing wrong there, anyway. Right? And then we can do our so there's the passive sign convention for the mesh IL. And I would actually write that as plus and plus, but anyway, we get the, the same equation. Okay. And now this time we know that the voltage across the inductor is L di dt. Remember I talked about um, ignition systems on gas cars where you've got a, a distributor that has what used to be called points in it. These days it's usually an electronic system where the, the points are a mechanical uh, switch that opens periodically and that opening of the switch cuts the current so it makes the ILDT the derivative very big because you opened a switch the, the current stops and that gives you the nice big voltage that you need to spark the spark plug a lot of a lot of cars these days use an electronic version of the same thing. Mm, different way of generating the large voltage. And then uh, you've got Ohm's law, V equals IR. And you can take VL and put it there. And you can take VR and put it there. And then you can rewrite it to get that equation. And then divide everything by R. And we get L on R, the L I D T equals uh, plus I L equals zero, or L on R, L on R, the I L D T equals minus I L. So just like we had something can't change for the capacitor, we have something that can't change for the inductor. The current can't change. Right? That's what this equation here is telling us. V equals L D I D T. If the IDT changes abruptly, we get a very big voltage. And just like we had before, we now have another first order differential equation. And the solution to a first order differential equation is a decaying exponential. 
remember with your solving differential equations you've got two solutions usually you've got the unforced solution which is what this one is and the forced solution we don't have any forced solution we not, don't have any driving current so uh, we don't need to take that solution into account So here we've, we are discharging an inductor. That means that the inductor had current flowing through it. So the next thing is to charge an inductor. So we'll do exactly the same thing we had before, but now we've got a voltage applied. And I have a, an error that I should fix. That should be VL, not VC. I should uh, check that. This is charging an inductor. Okay. So, um, here we again do a, a KVL equation. And again, that's probably... Again, wish I knew what I'm doing to make it not draw. Anyway, so we can't change the polarity of the active source, but the passive sign convention applies uh, to the passive devices, the resistor and the capacitor. And then we can just insert our values for VR and VL. And again, we get a first order differential equation again. The solution to a first order differential equation is a decaying exponential. And oops, yet another one. I don't know why that I didn't notice that one before. No. Again, this thing here, L on R. is sometimes called tau and whereas for a capacitor the time constant is r times c for an inductor it's l divided by r and what do you think the units of tau are Uh, well, it, why would it be unitless? What do you think it... So it's, it's T on tau, right? And it's E to the minus T on tau. So if it were unitless, the units of inductance would be the same as the units of resistance, right? The units of impedance are the same, but the the actual L rather than J omega L has a different unit. Huh? It's the units.
units of time. It is a time constant. Usually it's in seconds. That way up here you get a, a unitless quantity in the exponential. Another algorithm. So let's just have a look. See if I can find an example. All right, here we go. This is the sort of question that we're this stuff is aimed at answering. Right? We have a switch in the circuit that changes at time t equals zero and we've got to find some quantity in this case it'll be the current through the inductor as a function of time. So the assumption the, well, the, it's hard to know at any time after zero and before time infinity what the actual value of the current is. But just before time zero and at infinite time, we can assume that the circuit has been in that state for a long time. And that means we can assume that the circuit is in what's called steady state. Uh, steady state means the state is not changing. Any of the va variables in the circuit are not changing. So just before time zero is when the switch is on the left hand side. And at infinite time, the switch is on the right-hand side. Okay, so what... Wherever it got to. What this algorithm is telling you is find the initial condition. Right? Because it was in steady state. find the final condition because at time infinity the circuit is also in steady state. One of the problems with analyzing circuits with resistors, inductors and capacitors in them at the same time is that you get a second order differential equation. And the trouble with a second order differential equation is one of the solutions, well, the solution of a second order differential equation is a damped sinusoid or a damped cosinusoid. If the damping on those things is negligible, then you get an oscillation. Right? You get a sine wave without the damping. So the whole trick with any of these questions, whether we're solving for current or voltage, is that that is the so that is the equation you have to solve. x of t is k1 plus k2 e to the minus t on tau. 
and the reason you do the initial condition right x of zero again anything to the zeroth power is one and then x at infinity and anything to the minus infinite power provided that anything is greater than one is zero so the nice thing about the initial condition and the final condition is we've got three things we've got to find well, we've got to find k1 k2 and tau the nice thing about initial condition and final condition is we forget can forget about tau we can do tau independently so we can solve for k1 and k2 right, so that's what step three here is step four is a slightly tricky step depending on the circuit let's go back here if the switch is in this condition right what's the seven and resistance let me see if I can pick on someone Nicholas, any idea what the feminine resistance of this side of the circuit is? Yeah, exactly, just R2. Right? So this circuit is pretty simple. If I had you know, some more resistors in there. Finding the feminine resistance may require a little bit more work. But in this case, this is the feminine resistance. But there are other questions, I think. Let me see if I can, I don't know whether I've got any more, maybe I don't. I think these are all Seven and Norton questions. No, I don't think I've got um, any other transient ones here that are more complicated. Okay, so we find the feminine resistance around the storage element. Like I said, that can be complicated. For that example, it's not. Oops. And then if you've got the feminine resistance and you've got the inductance or the capacitance of the storage element, then you can use that to find tau. 
either tau equals RC or tau equals L on R depending on whether the storage element is a capacitor or an inductor. And you've got everything you need. You've got K1, you've got K2, you've got tau. So you write X of T, whether X is a voltage or a current, is K1 plus K2 times E to the minus T on tau. I used the term steady state before. And I said it, the circuit is in steady state if it's been doing what it's doing for a long time. So then the question is, what is a long time? Right? Obviously, infinity is a long time. But it'd be nice to have something a little bit more concrete. And while it's not that concrete, We usually say that uh, a circuit's in steady state after five time constants. And the reason we say it's in steady state after five time constants is because this is five time constants. And that is, that's a logarithmic scale, right? Can log sorry, base 10 logarithm e to the minus t on tau. And what that's telling me is that five time constants means that the value is within 1% of its final value. Okay, so that's why the rule of thumb is five time constants. You could say it's, you know, 4.9 something time constants if you want it to be exactly 1% but five is much easier to remember. You know, if you were doing something with the, that required a bit more accuracy, you might want to do, um, I don't know, within one in a thousand, right? So maybe you'd want seven time constants. But most of the stuff we do, 1% is quite good enough. Okay, so here's an example. The switch has been positioned to the left for a very long time. At t equals zero seconds, the switch is moved to the right. Find an expression for I L of t for time greater than zero. And we've got a three amp supply which is pretty big. So I'm going to, uh, I'm going to pick on Justin. Justin, what is the current at time zero. Right, so one thing to remember is you can forget about everything over here. You can forget about R2. The only thing at time just before time zero is 
the two 1K resistors, the 3 amp supply, and the inductor. No? Okay. William, any thoughts? So the 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 what's in parallel? Right, that, that's a good start. So what, how, if, how would you, you've got two things in parallel, how would you find their uh, impedance? Sorry, do the... Yep. Yep. Right, so what does that say? Exactly. Exactly. So the the thing William was initially struggling with, but he got there in the end, is that this is a a zero frequency supply, right? It's a constant supply. So because that's a constant supply, this thing, the inductor is just a wire. It doesn't have any impedance at zero frequency. Okay, so because it's just a wire at zero frequency, all we've got is our 3 amp and 2 1k resistors. Oops. No, I didn't mean to do that. Right, and the, the current we're interested in is that there. So we've just got equal resistances. So the initial current is just split equally between both of the 1k ohm resistors. So we get one and a half amps in one side and one and a half amps in the other side. That way if we look at this node here Maybe if we can look at this node, there we go. Right. We need those three currents to sum to zero. There's nothing to distinguish going between one 1k and the other 1k, so they're going to have equal currents. So both of those currents have to add to three amps. So it's one and a half amps. Okay, so that's our initial condition.
So the final condition is what happens at time infinity. So now the switch is on the right hand side. And let me pick on someone else. Amar, any thoughts on what the final current is going to be? Hmm? Uh, well, so remember the when we got the switch over to the right hand side. The circuit we have is just that. And we've been going for a long time. So the any current that was there is discharged into the resistor. The resistor is going to... Any other thoughts? No? Let me, uh, let me try someone else. Uh, Missing all Daniels today. Aritro, any thoughts? Yeah, it's just zero. By that stage, as I said, there's there's nothing driving the current in this circuit, right? So it's always going to be, uh, it's going to be discharging as far as it can, and as far as it can is a zero current. Right, so now let's remember our, the thing we're after is I L of T equals K1 plus K2 e to the minus t on tau. And we know at zero, it's k1 plus k2. And at infinity, that's k1. So that tells us that k1 is zero. So our expression is just 1.5 times e to the minus t on tau. And then we've got to find tau. Again, this circuit is the same as the example, right? So the Thevenin resistance is just 2k. So that's five millihenries. Divided by two thousand, which is two point five by ten to the minus six. Which is two point five microseconds. Right, so the final full answer is 1.5 times e to the minus t on 2.5 by 10 to the minus 6. I'm okay with you saying that as 1.5 e to the minus t on 2.5 provided you also state that t is in microseconds. So then the, we can look at 5 tau, 
right? Steady state type. Which is what? Uh, 12.5 microseconds. That's one thing you'll find when we do the transients lab. Um, with the capacitors, you can get really big time constants. So they're pretty easy to see. But with the inductors, the time constants are pretty tiny. Any questions about that? Well, it's about break time, so let's take a, uh, let's just make it a 10 minute break. And I have, I'll do one more example, a capacitor example when we come back. And I want to quickly talk about um, three phase as well. Okay.
turn that on again. Make that go away. Just check we've got audio back. We have audio. There was a big lag there. Okay. So I didn't explicitly say it on the first question, but often I will ask about the steady state time. So remember the steady state time is just 5 times tau, whether tau is RC or whether tau is um, L on R. So I thought it'd be good to do a, a, another example and this example has a few things that are different. One particular thing that's different is you'll notice that the final circuit doesn't just have a single resistor it's got a network of resistances. So you can't just say immediately what the Thevenin resistance of that circuit is. It's pretty easy, as we'll see, but it's not just one of the values of the resistors like it was in the other example. Okay, so let's Go back to our algorithm. It's about a five second delay. So initial condition, final condition, solve for K1, K2, seven and resistance, tau, write the equation. So we have this time we're after V C of T. So V C of T. One way to think about the initial condition is that the circuit came into existence at time minus infinity and now we've brought up to the time t equals zero. So the circuit with at time t equals zero is uh, actually bef just before time t equals zero, time t equals zero minus, is the circuit without the switch in it. Right, the switch and the, the wires connecting the switch are gone, but everything else is there. But the circuit has been in that condition for a long time. So the first thing is to find Vc at zero. Uh, Abigail, do you have any thoughts on how you would find the voltage across the capacitor at time zero? Sorry, would it just be six volts? Can you explain your reasoning? No? You're right, but it'd be nice to know the reasoning so everybody could get there, right? So Vc at time zero 
is just 6 volts. Right, I, I hope you remember I hope you remember the mean. Right? Right? The mean basically uh, a capacitor is open circuit at DC, at omega equals zero. It's just a gap. Right? So at time zero, what that circuit looks like is just that, right, where I've redrawn these three as a single equivalent resistance, REQ. And as Ab Abigail says, because there's no current flowing, the voltage here is the same as the voltage here, because there's no, there's no voltage gain or drop across the 10k and the voltage here is the same as the voltage here because there's no current flow yeah That's correct. Yeah, so then there would right, but then there would there wouldn't be in steady state. That's why I, I made the song a dance about it having been in this state for a long time. Right. You're right, you're right. Exactly. Right. So you have to you have to know or assume that the initial condition is steady state and that the final condition is also steady state. If there's anything changing, it's not in steady state. Okay. So, what next? So that gives us the initial condition. Oops, let's go back to that. The other one is the final condition. And now the, the final condition, we have the switches on. So the 10K and the 6 volts are, um, are not there in effect. They've been shorted out by the, the switch. I, I recommend, that's why I drew this one out separately. I recommend drawing them out separately. Um, right, so effectively the final circuit is that. So 
So with all of that information, Sonia Lees, what do you think the final voltage is going to be? Uh, well, so there's there's no there's no voltage there's no voltage source or current source here, right? So the capacitor started off with six volts across it, and then all it's going to do is discharge. Just be zero, exactly, right? So there's our initial condition, six volts. Our final condition, zero volts. Now, it's not necessary that the final condition is zero volts. If I had a voltage source or a current source in the final circuit, then things would change, right? But because there's no source in the final circuit. The only the final circuit is just this. It's just going to discharge, so I end up with zero. Okay. Then remember the uh, K1 plus K2 e to the minus zero on tau which is just K1 plus K2, and this one is K1 plus K2 e to the minus infinity on tau, which is just K1, so K1 is 0, so K2 is 6. Alright, so our Vc of t is K1, which is 0, plus K2, e to the minus t on tau. And now the tricky part is is to find tau. Tau is the Thevenin resistance times the capacitance. So the Thevenin resistance is basically the equivalent resistance of those three, three uh, resistors. And I hope you can see that the 3K and the 6K combine in series to be 9K. Then you've got 9K equivalent in series with a 9, sorry, in parallel with a 9K resistor. So 9K in parallel with 9K is just four and a half K. And that's also equal to REQC. So it's 4,500 times, uh, what's that, 10 to the minus four? 100 times 10 to the minus six, which is 10 to the minus four. And what's that? One, two, three, four. Which is point four five seconds. And then the, the follow-up question, at what time can the circuit be considered to be in steady state? Well, it's just our 5 times tau. And I think it's 2.25 seconds. As I said, capacitors tend to have bigger time constants than inductors. Tend to, not always. You can get some very small capacitances and very large capacitances. 
that uh, very small capacitances tend to give you small, much smaller time constants. Picofarad. So let me just go back and reiterate. The key equation for transients in RC circuits is x of t equals k1 plus k2 e to the minus t on tau. The initial condition is just k1 plus k2. The final condition is just k1. And then the sometimes the trickier bit is to find the tau and tau is either RC if you've got a capacitor in the circuit or tau is L on R if you've got an inductor in the circuit. And then the overall thing is just again K1 plus K2 e to the minus T on tau. Any questions about those? I haven't got many um, examples of this in the tutorial. I will try and find some more um, later on. Okay. Any, any questions? All good? So I wanted to talk about these things. I don't think we've got any of the bigger ones here. I think we may have some down in the electrical engineering lab. Um, this stuff is mains power. Can anybody tell me what the three pins are? Good. Ground I'll take, positive and negative, so we've got alternating current. Any idea what, what we call positive and negative when it's hot and neutral? I, I, so I I learnt this stuff in Australia, so we usually call it active and neutral, but hot and neutral is is the same one. It's funny, I, I was looking up the, uh, the colour codings the other night, and wouldn't you know it, for one of the phases, and I'll explain what I mean by phase, Australia and the US swap the colours between neutral and one of the phases. So uh, I, I, I don't think I should be wiring houses in the US. So, as I said, the stuff coming out of the wall here is um, alternating current. It's 60 hertz, and depending on who you believe, somewhere between 100 and 120 volts. Hmm. So it's a lot bigger than you would expect from a battery, right? Even a car battery is only 12 volts. And so look after it. The ground, just a reminder, Uh, let's just turn that off first. I just want to grab somebody's assignment and I 
can't do that without uh, showing you everybody's grades. So I don't want to show you everybody's grades. Right, so the middle pin here finds its way out to the outside of your building and there's usually a spike in the ground and that gives you your ground or your earth. Right, that's usually your reference. That's what the middle thing is doing. The other two, active and neutral, how do you tell the difference? Right? They've both got 110 volts coming at them. They're going positive and negative. So unless you start a, at a particular time, one of them's going to be positive and the other one's going to be negative and vice versa. Right? But there is a difference. And the difference comes in the way the voltage is generated. Let's have a quick look. No, I don't want that one. So the way the voltage is generated is in a generator, right? A generator consists of two things, usually what's called a stator. That's the outside part of the generator. Motors also have stators. In fact, if you design them correctly, a motor can also be a generator. The stator is on the outside. And then the rotor, the thing that rotates, can look like this. And each of those different colored series of lines is nothing but an inductor. It's a, a, a coil of wire. The stator generates a magnetic field and the rotor moves through that magnetic field. And if you've done some physics, you may know that if you have a conductor moving through a magnetic field, that's going to generate electricity, an EMF, electromotive force, an electrical field. And most, in fact, I think all, but it might have to be all, generators, for our, at least for our mains, use three phases. And this is the relationship between the three phases. Right, I hope you can see that as that rotor rotates, it's going from 0 to 10 to 20 to 90 to 180 to 270 back to 0. Right, so it's going round in a circle. And that's effectively what's happening here, right? We've got, let's look at the A phase, right? So this is zero, oops, thought I got that one. This is zero degrees, and this is 360 degrees when it comes back to the other side. And then each of the, the wires each of the inductors on the rotor are 
displaced by 120 degrees from each other, right? So if we look at this angle here, that's 120 degrees. If we look at this angle here, that's 120 degrees. Now, which one have I missed? I've done blue to grey. I've done white to blue. I need to do white to grey. I can do that here, maybe. No? 120 degrees. So this one, the blue phase, reaches a peak 120 degrees after the black phase. And then the dashed phase reaches a peak another 120 degrees on. So effectively, that's, that's what's happening. For an AC generator, you're not just generating one voltage, one AC voltage, you're generating three, one per phase. If you have a look, in fact, I might do another, another bonus assignment. If you go and have a look at the power lines outside um, on the on the poles on the street, you should see. In fact, you usually see four wires. Right, three of them are the three phases. These three phases. Anybody got any idea what the fourth one is? Uh, usually not. Good guess. So, anybody, anybody else got a thought on what the, the fourth wire is? Let me pick on one more person, see if I can... AJ, any thoughts? It is. So it's a ground. One of the biggest faults that you get in power distribution systems is lightning strikes. And you often want to protect the three phases from lightning strikes. So oftentimes, in order to attract those lightning strikes, what you'll see is you'll see your three phases, and then the fourth wire up here will be a protection. Might not be ground as such, but what you what I, I know I see in my area is at the bottom of every power pole is one of those ground spikes doesn't happen everywhere, but part of the reason is to attempt to protect against uh, lightning strikes. Actually, I had a... Uh, I had a, uh, a professor when I was doing my degree, and his research speciality was a thing called pole top fires. Right, so the the electricity pole right, has it's quite tall and then usually it has insulators and the wires carrying the three phases sit on top of the insulators. 
And one one thing he found, because he was interested in damage to these poles, one thing he found is um, he got this bizarre series of, of faults where lightning hit the pole, hit the, the crossbar, and split it down the middle exactly. And he was, he looked at some of the other poles around the area and he figured out what was happening was that the people who were making the poles got the crossbar, found the center line of the crossbar, drew the center line in with a pencil and then drilled the holes on the, the center line. They didn't erase the pencil line. So what was happening was the lightning was hitting the pencil line. It was arcing straight down the pencil line, splitting it in exactly in two. Right, which is quite, quite bizarre. So they had to change the way they made their center lines. The other one that he had was he found this pole here is actually metal. And what he found was that in some areas there was a little bit of charring happening around here. And it, the charring had built up and built up and then it would catch fire. And what he found was there was a the the reason it catch fire was because of the a close lightning strike. It didn't have to be a direct hit, it just had to increase the potential around the bar a little bit. And what he found that was enough to to make that really blow up. The area where it was happening was on the coast. So what you'd see on what he'd see on all of these crossbars was there was a lot of sea spray or dried up sea spray salt except in a little area around each insulator the area around the insulator was free of sea spray because the it was like a little umbrella right so what they did to fix it, the reason why it was it was arcing was because the sea spray on this area was conductive. But the little area around each conduct each insulator wasn't because it didn't have sea spray underneath it. Because of that lack of conductance, that meant that the potential difference between that spike and this area of, of the, the bar could build up. The, the voltage could build up. Once the voltage built up, you could arc and you'd get, you'd get charring. So what they did which for everybody involved in the industry at the time was completely counterintuitive. What they did is they got a little bit of wire, wrapped it round that pole and took it outside the shade of the, the insulator and just hammered it into the pole. That way there wasn't as much of a uh, well, there wasn't a, a, a gradient between the, the spike that the uh, insulator was sitting on and the, the sea spray covered crossbar. It was kind of interesting.
that's a complete diversion. I apologise. But um, the thing is, though, they're your three phases, right? A, B, and C. And usually, you'll only get one phase to your house. Sometimes, if you need a lot of power, a lot of commercial premises get all three phases. And they use a different plug to get all three phases into the power system. Right? And the, the thing to remember is, is this. A three-phase circuit generates, distributes, and uses energy in the form of three voltages equal in magnitude and symmetric in phase. And they're the equations there. Right? They've all got the same magnitude, Vm. The only, they've got the same frequency, omega t. The only difference is um, the phase. Zero phase for A, minus 120 for B, minus 240 for C. Now it's funny, I, as I think I've said before, I come from Australia. In Australia, the mains is actually running at 50 hertz, whereas in the States it runs at 60 hertz. In Japan, they have a, quite a bizarre system because some parts of the Japanese grid run at 50 hertz and other parts run at 60 hertz. And so they have these, they have these rather large, hey, they have these rather large substations that are just converting frequency between a 50 hertz and a 60 hertz. And they're basically just, um, uh, if you like, big motor generator pairs. 50 hertz goes in one side and 60 hertz comes out the other. It seems a little wasteful. Okay. So, uh, I'm not going to, I, I don't need to go through most of these. I want to mainly talk to you about this in pictures. So, as you might imagine, there's lots of ways to, to start analysing this. And one obvious way is, is this approach, right? We've got our three voltage sources connected together. And they're the voltage sources that we had on the slide previously, the uh, v cosine omega t, v cosine omega t minus 120, v cosine omega t minus 240. And that's how we model the voltage. Now, notice the difference though, right? The thing that we're actually seeing here is the difference between what's coming out of the, of the A branch and what's coming out of the B branch. So this voltage is not the same as that voltage. The nice thing about this way of dealing with AC power is that it tells you what the neutral is. Right? That point in the middle is the neutral. I believe 
and it's not always the case, I believe that the neutral is usually the slightly smaller of the holes here, and the active, I believe. Is that right? No? Um, it's for protection. So, the, it used to be that most electrical pieces of equipment were in metal boxes, and to, if anything went wrong inside the metal box, they connected the metal box to ground directly. So rather than going through you, if there was a problem, it'd go through the, the ground. Right? What happens now, though, for protection does isn't that. That's why it's it's actually not not needed to have the the ground. What happens now is right. You have your active. You have your neutral, and you have your load. Let's just give it a... What they do now is... They can measure... the current, IA and IN. But if there's a problem, here's me, I'm the problem, right? And I touch, oops, go away, go away. And I touch there, and the current flows through me, IA and IN are going to be different, right? And I've forgotten what they call them in this country. When, the way I learnt it, the thing that protects you is called a core balanced relay. It looks at those two currents, and if there's a bit of uh, enough of a difference between those two things, it throws the circuit breaker. Right. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's that's basically why. That the the ground is is often useful for protection, but it's not needed. when something uses that ground so um so uh so there's there's a lot of there's a lot of um reasons other than protection the protection one is like I said, if you've got the outside of the box grounded and there's a right, there's something that breaks in here and it it energizes the, the outside of the box, then rather than if you touch that without the ground, you'd get zapped. Right? So that's that's one thing. Do we have any uh, audio engineers here? Any people who who do the roadie thing? So the the other place where grounds are useful is um, if you've got lots of equipment, particularly the way you 
the place you might notice it most is audio equipment, but it's just about any equipment. Um, if you just have a, an ungrounded piece of equipment over here, and another ungrounded piece of equipment over there, and just say you had, uh, I'm going to use the chassis ground, not the, right? so I'm just looking at the, the computer box without having the, the, the ground there. If you look at the chassis, and you measure the voltage between those two chassis without having that ground in place, that can be 10 volts. That can be 60 volts. I did uh, some work at a steel mill at one stage. We had to instrument a, um, it was called the entry roller. Um, they, uh, we needed to measure the vibration on the, the bearing. And we couldn't put the computer that was measuring things really close to the, the roller because it was really hot and it was really yucky. So um, we had a, a, a cabinet, a little bit, an equipment cabinet a little bit away. And so we had to run a, a wire or a, a coax cable from the equipment cabinet to where the um, where the uh, vibration sensor was. And we couldn't we did, couldn't find a place to ground it. The, we did a, a, a voltage measurement between the ground at the where the sensor was mounted and the ground where the computer was. It was 60 volts difference. And you can imagine if you're working with audio, it's maybe of the order of three volts maximum. You've got to put 60 volts on top of that. That's, that changes things. Right. Um, I don't know whether that's a good enough answer, but making sure that all the equipment is at the same potential is another reason to have that ground everywhere. Well, so that, that's why I asked about the audio engineers because um, sometimes in a house you'll have different circuits, right? And those different circuits will have different grounds. If you're an audio engineer and you're working um, on a on a concert or what have you and the audio equipment you're using you plug it into two separate circuits if they have two separate grounds they're going to get a different voltage and what you end up happening is there's this effect called a ground loop and the biggest effect usually is that there's a big, often it'll pick up the, the main 60 hertz and you'll hear that mains hum really loudly through the amplifiers. So um, that's a slightly different problem but it, it's again you've got to be make it, the fix is to make sure that everything is plugged in to the same ground not necessarily different ground. Again, I don't know whether that answers it. But, uh. Okay. So this is one active. Oops. This is another active. This is another active. This point here is the neutral.
Now, as you might imagine, there's another way to look at this. And it's, it's on the screen already, right? So this way of looking at it is called the Y way of looking at it. It should just be the letter Y, but usually it's written W-Y-E. And if you're only interested in domestic um, power, 110 volts, that works fine because it's basically the voltage between neutral and active is 110 volts. But sometimes you actually are interested in VAB. And so sometimes you want to use the, the model on the right, which looks like a triangle or a, a capital Greek letter delta. So that's, that's called a delta, or in this case, delta connected sources. And that's a slightly different thing, but it gives you, it means you can analyze VAB directly or VBC directly or VCA directly rather than having to um, work it out from VA, VB and VC individually. Right? So there's a couple of ways you can do this. One way is by having the neutrals connected. And the other way is to do a three-wire version. Now normally VA, VB and VC are the same except for that phase difference. Unfortunately, my home is a different load from my sister's home or from my mother's home, right? So ZA, ZB and ZC are often different. If those Z, A, Z, B, and Z, C are different. That's called an unbalanced load. If they were all the same, that would be a balanced load. We're pretty, we're, the power company is usually pretty good about getting V, A, V, B, and V, C all the same. Um, consumers are really bad at getting Z, A, Z, B, and Z, C all the same. Right, because they could be three different households. They could be three different circuits in the one house or the one apartment block. Um, so that if that's the case, then the currents are all different. And you maybe get, if you've got the four wire system, then you potentially get a, a bigger neutral to neutral current. I don't want to tell you much more except to say that there is a thing called a Y to delta or a delta to Y conversion. Right, so here we have a Y connected load with Z, A, Z, B and Z, C and a delta connected load Z1, Z2 and Z3. And you can transform from one to the other. ZA is Z1 times Z2 on the sum of the impedances. ZB is Z2 times Z3 on the sum. And ZC is Z1 times Z2 divided by the sum. 
Similarly, you can get Z1 from ZA, ZB, and ZC. I'm not going to read those out. Just to note that they do have another uh, a sum in the numerator and a, an impedance in the denominator. If all of the impedances are equal, then you get the balanced formulation. Right? In that case, the y impedances are all just one third of the delta impedances or conversely the delta impedances are three times the y impedances but only if they're balanced right? you have to have everything balanced otherwise you've got to use the unbalanced formulation So here are two um, one delta, one y impedance connections, right? It's a three phase load. And this example just uses those delta y conversions to find the equivalent overall uh, load. So the first thing we do is we convert this Y impedance to a delta impedance using those equations. And then it's a bit hard to see but I hope you can just see that, let's just have a look at the B node. Right, there's the B node. And here's A. I hope you can see that those two impedances are in parallel. Right? They're connected between the same two nodes. So we can just combine those two using the standard 1 over 1 over Z1 plus 1 over Z2 to get a single impedance. Let me just draw C in a, another color. Right, so this one, let's go with orange. This one and this one are connected between the green and the blue phases. So uh, we can do the same thing again. Just combine them in parallel. Let's go with purple. And then this one and this one. A bit hard to see the difference between that and the pink, but those are also connected between the magenta and the cyan or the magenta and the blue, so they're also in parallel. So that's all that's happening here, right? So that's the equivalent. That's the equivalent. And then that's the equivalent.
and then the last one going from C to D is just doing the delta Y transform, or delta Y conversion. Okay. That is pretty much all I wanted to tell you about uh, three phase circuits. Right, the main thing to remember is that table. That you can convert from a Y connected load to a delta connected load. And it all works. Any questions? I'll take that as a resounding no. Okay, so we'll have a bit of a break shortly. I did want to try and do lab what is it, seven? Is that the one? I've forgotten. So the Thevenin theorem and maximum power transfer. The trouble with this lab is the maximum power transfer one is a pain to do uh, because all of the settings here only have one multimeter. And for this table, and that reminds me, I think uh, we might not be able to do it. Oh well, we might have to do that next time once I'm a bit better organized. I'll see if we can do it. Right, so for this table, you've got to measure two things every time the voltage and the current, right, for lots of different settings. And that's a bit of a pain with just one multimeter. So what I suggest you do is team up with another group or another person if you're in a single person group and use the other one's multimeter for either the current measurement all the time or the voltage measurement all the time. And uh, that will make life much easier. It takes a lot less time. I did want to say one other thing. Let me, I just realized I, I don't know whether we've got... have a look at that. So these things are called potentiometers. Sometimes they're called variable resistors. Sometimes they're called volume controls. Huh? And I just realized I used to have some of these with uh, wires connected to them so they're easy to connect to the breadboards but I don't know where they are since we moved buildings and I no longer have access to the equipment room so uh, we might have to put off that until next time but the idea with these is if you've got um, let's see if I should have a picture up here somewhere here we go Right, that's what it is. The middle pin is connected between two resistors. And I think all of these are 
if you look at the top one and the bottom one, the, the left pin and the right pin, the total resistance is 10k. What happens when you move that dial around is where pin 2 hits the resistor changes. So if it's all the way to the left, then the resistance between 1 and 2 is small, 0 hopefully. And the resistance between 2 and 3 is 10k. If it's all the way to the right, and I'm, so I'm turning it uh, clockwise to go to the right, then uh, the resistance between 3 and 2 is negligible and the resistance between 1 and 2 is 10k. Okay, and I think that's the way, yeah, that's the way we want to use it, right? So effectively we connect pins two and three together and we just have a that way we just have a resistor that changes from zero uh, to 10k maybe zero to 1k no, zero to 10k is right Okay, we might leave doing the maximum power transfer until after the break, so in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so the rest of it, though, is about Thevenin's theorem, or Norton's theorem, because we don't have any uh, current supplies. We'll, uh, we'll go with... Um, we we'll go with Thevenin. Right, so the aim is to put together that circuit and then think about what happens if we think about R3 as the load, right? And we want to change R1, R2 and Vs into a Thevenin equivalent circuit. So it's just a voltage source and a series. Um, so because this one's got a, an independent supply, we can, I'm just asking you to use the uh, open circuit voltage short circuit current technique. Right, draw the circuits, um, calculate what they should be, measure what they should be, measure the uh, open circuit voltage, measure the short circuit current. So just a reminder, what this voltage, what this voltmeter looks like is this where this is usually of the order of a hundred mega ohms maybe 10 mega ohms what this one looks like yeah I don't know why I keep doing that it also looks like this But this is really small, right? The reason for the difference is you're measuring voltage and you're measuring current. If you're doing a measurement, you don't want the act of measuring to change what you're measuring, right? So if you put a really big impedance 
in series with a voltmeter, that's not going to have a whole lot of effect on the circuit. Similarly, if you're measuring current, you don't want to introduce more resistance. So you want the impedance of the ammeter to be really tiny. When I was in high school, um, the class clown asked the teacher, how many amps can you pull out of the, the main socket? And the teacher gave some answer. The clown wanted to measure it. So they got an ammeter, they stuck it in the... The ammeter has negligible resistance. In Australia, the mains voltage is 240 volts. So thankfully, it just blew the fuse in, in, the, in the ammeter. It may have actually broken the ammeter because they were the old uh, galvanometer-based ones mechanical uh, dials. So don't do that. Or at least think about it before you do it. Expect the result. Okay. Um, I don't have anything else to say. We all good about doing the lab? Yeah? So if you have any questions, um, I'll have the uh, my queuing app running, just click on that link and uh, ask me questions. Feel free to have a break before you start. I'll be around until about one o'clock.